for our, our final talk, it'll be um, Dr. Graham Coop from the um, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at uh, UC Davis. Okay, uh, hopefully you're seeing my slides and you can hear me. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to talk on this important topic. I've learned a lot from the talks this morning and from the previous session. So I thought it would be useful to take a step back as a population geneticist and talk about this uh, use of genetic ancestry descriptors. So like Nancy, I'll start with my take home messages at the start of my talk. And first of all, as we all know, genetic variation varies relatively smoothly across individuals. And as a consequence of that, genetic populations are not out there in the real world. They're a statistical modeling construct that can be useful in various ways, but can also hinder our thinking. But despite that, genetic sample descriptors are likely unavoidable in practice. We need them to combine our, and communicate our findings verbally to each other. But as you're all more aware than I am, they're a source of ongoing confusion in the literature and in debates in society. I'd argue, and this is gonna be the point of this talk, that this term of genetic ancestry group is a term that we as a field should mostly move away from. In most applications, researchers simply mean genetic similarity or genetic relatedness to a set of other known samples where some set of labels have been predefined. This call to move towards using genetic similarity is not a new one. It's been echoed numerous times. Here's two recent examples calling for more precision in what we mean by uh, genetic ancestry. But I push beyond that to say that rather than being more precise by what we mean by genetic similarity, we should simply move away from as genetic ancestry, we should move towards using genetic similarity. Okay, so genetic populations are often a useful modeling construct. When we're making uh, mathematical models, statistical models, we're often simplifying reality to talking about relatively simple homogeneous populations. But those populations don't exist out there in the real world. Those modeling constructs are often very useful for statistical approaches, but they can also hinder communication and also hinder our thinking in how we think about the real world. In reality, we're all related to each other to varying extents in an unimaginably complicated family tree. And as a consequence of that, patterns of relatedness and genetic similarity varies fairly smoothly across individuals shaped by geography and population history, often in ways that are correlated with environments. Because of that incredible complexity of genetic structure, there's no one right level to describe genetic structure. It's necessary to think about the set of issues that we're currently dealing with to think about what an appropriate level is to describe that. And as a consequence of the incredible complexity of genetic structure, all verbal descriptions will necessarily be incomplete and misleading in some applications. And these issues are coming more and more to the fore with the increasing breadth of sampling as we've seen illustrated throughout these morning talks. Okay, so if you know, we're incredibly related in all sorts of varying ways, why then do we use genetic descriptors and labels in our analyses? Well, there's a array of different reasons that we've heard throughout this session and in the previous sessions. There's various explanations we could put forward. When we're looking at a set of results, for example, principal components, we see patterns in the data and we're interested in what do those various axes of population structure reflect? Are they reflecting some sort of geographic decline in the data? Moreover, when we go on to apply statistical genomics methods or population genomics methods, to data, those are often based on relatively simple models that assume somewhat homogeneous groups. So for example, in genome-wide association studies, it's really helpful to have a pseudo-randomization of genotypes at a locus across genetic backgrounds and environmental causes of variation. 
As a consequence of that, samples are often subset, and there's a need for descriptors of how the data has been subset. Further, when we combine data across different uh, platforms, different data types, there's a need for a communication of how we've done that. How have we combined data? What labels have we used to combine data? And primarily, I think that a lot of what's happening when we're using these labels and descriptors is there for verbal communication. We can make quantitative statements about where someone falls on a principal component graph, but if we're going to communicate across papers and across uh, time to each other, we often need population descriptors and genetic population descriptors to talk about how individuals fall on some continuum of relatedness. Okay, so one common genetic sample descriptor applied in human genetics is the evocative term of genetic ancestry group. And in the rest of my talk, I'll be talking about that concept. So first of all, I want to distinguish between two different concepts, one of which is a concept of genetic ancestors, which I'd argue we can be relatively precise about, at least in theory, versus this broader concept of genetic ancestry group. More than a few hundred generations back, you're descended from tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people further back, but you've inherited your genome from a relatively limited subset of those individuals who lived in, lived in the past. Those are your genetic ancestors. Population genomic data can inform us about our relatedness to each other and about our relationships to those genetic ancestors in relatively precise ways. But the interpretation of those patterns of relatedness and of who those genetic ancestors were necessarily come through combinations with other types of data, such as geographical sampling locations and other genetic, uh, other sample descriptors. Over the past number of decades, through computational, statistical, and genomic advances, we're getting much more advanced about describing our patterns of relatedness to each other and our relationships to our genetic ancestors in the past. Through data descriptions, such as estimating ancestral recombination graphs, we can learn vast amounts of information about our genetic relationships to each other. And that's a really interesting development in the field of human genetics. But those representations, such as ancestral recombination graphs, are necessarily very high dimensional uh, descriptions of the data and not what genetic, human geneticists mean by genetic ancestry groups. Rather, when we go back to talking about genetic ancestry groups, and I'm critiquing the concept here, though I have frequently used this in the past myself, when we speak of genetic ancestry groups, we're nearly always dealing about a, a discussion of genetic similarity, as Gil highlighted earlier, to other individuals by some relatively simple summary statistic. So for example, looking at a principal components plot. Here we have the thousand genomes individuals placed on a, the first two axes of a principal component plot and labeled by their thousand genomes reference panel label. If you positioned me on this principal component graph, I'd fall close to other European individuals. And on the basis of that, you might say I have European genetic ancestry and that's a reasonable statement, right? But really what it is, the statement is, is that I am similar on these principal component axes to other individuals who are labeled as European in the thousand genomes reference panel. We get more precise descriptions uh, more quantitative prescriptions from approaches such as structure-like approaches, which give quantitative breakdowns of a proportion of an individual's genome, which it corresponds to different ancestries. So someone's genome might be described as having 60% of their ancestry drawn from ancestry X, 40% of their ancestry drawn from ancestry Y. But again, fundamentally, those are descriptions of the proportion of an individual's genome that is more similar or closer to a particular set of predefined reference samples. We see approaches which are you know, statistically advanced, looking at even more fine-grained descriptions. For example, looking along an individual's genome, there are statistical approaches which can call ancestry along an individual's genome, 
And we can see portions of the genome which are called as having different ancestry types. But again, those statements about local ancestry along the genome are a statement about similarity to some set of reference samples whose ancestry we've chosen to call. So all of these statements about genetic ancestry are really statements about genetic similarity. The hypotheses they put forward about genetic ancestors are reasonable, but are necessarily based on simple models and come with a set of caveats that are often not discussed. Okay, so I'm sure you all are aware of the many caveats here, but just to run through a few of them, the resolution and identity of the, identi of the ancestries we put forward are partially a function of the reference panels that we have access to or that we choose to use. Statements of ancestry usually bracket a specific time period, usually prior to 600 years, deeper than 600 years in the past, more recent than a few thousand years in the past, but that's usually left unsaid in our dis discussions of ancestry. These discussions of ancestry descriptors are often very broad geographical labels, which we all know have an unfortunate habit of overlapping racial labels. And fundamentally, these ancestry labels are modeling constructs, but become, can become reified in our minds and in the public's minds as having much more meaning than they do. I'd also argue that the use of genetic ancestry labels often obscures the inhomogeneity within ancestries and the continuum of relatedness across ancestries. Okay, so in response to that, there's a number of uh, responses that we could put forward. We see calls for finer grain ancestry, and that's good, right? It's good for us to move away from using continental ancestry descriptors. For example, moving to descriptors which are more geographically localized of ancestry, for example, Northwest European or British and Irish ancestry. But I'd argue that if we have difficulties to thinking about the concepts of European ancestry, we have even more difficulties defining what we mean by British and Irish ancestry at any point in the past. We could also think about slicing ancestry into different time periods in the past, asking about genetic ancestors in different time depths. And that's a really interesting set of approaches. We could also imagine tracing genetic ancestors back across geographic space to give a continuous view of where individuals' ancestors lived. But again, all of these approaches are actually more complex statements about genetic similarity. Phrased in terms of genetic ancestry, I think they're scientifically useful for population geneticists and genetic anthropologists interested in learning about human history. However, the vast amount of research in human genetics isn't focused on personal genomics or human history. Rather, the vast majority of research in human genetics, I'd argue, and I've you know, seen through these various sessions, is interested in using genetic ancestry for matching on genetic similarity and for making a correct set of comparisons or controls across different situations. For example, asking about are, uh, how do I calibrate the disease risk for this person given their genetic background? Are my experimental controls for my gene expression study correctly matched in terms of genetics? What set of polygenic scores should I use for this person or this haplotype? All of these fundamentally are statements about genetic similarity. And I'd argue that we could be far more precise in our language if we move towards talking about genetic similarity rather than genetic ancestry, making statements such as this, sim this sample is genetically similar to this other sample set, being clear about our basis of comparison in such comparisons, what other samples were possibly compared to, and what metric. And why I think this is important beyond moving away from the genetic concept of genetic ancestry is it moves us to thinking about how similar a match we need to make for what's an appropriate basis of comparison, what measures we are using to judge similarity. It puts a focus on what panels we're using to judge similarity and are those an appropriate basis for comparison in a particular situation, are they fine grained enough? And I'd also argue that talking about similarity, although it has that issues itself, doesn't homogenize as much within labels as talking about genetic, uh, genetic ancestry. It doesn't imply the same as when we use the word similarity, 
nor hopefully, well, it hopefully has less meaning than the term genetic ancestry group. When we talk about individuals being similar to each other, we're hopefully not implying more than that, than just that genetic similarity. So for all those reasons, I think that human genetics should move away from using genetic ancestry groups. In most applications, we simply mean genetic similarity and we'd be much clearer in our sample descriptions if we use those terms. Our methods are and should move forward to more thoroughly acknowledging the continuum of relatedness of people. But when we use verbal descriptions, there's always going to be some discreteness to those verbal descriptions. And so we should try and make them as clear as possible. Okay, and with that, I think I'd like to finish there and take questions from the panel along with everyone else.